Hello and welcome to the Canon Sports Podcast. I am your host, Ryan from Canon Sports, and joining me today, the 2006, 2010, and the 2021 CIF Girls Soccer Coach of the Year, live from Harvard Westlake. I'm here with Coach Richard Sims. Richard, thanks so much for joining the pod. Thank you for having me. Excited yeah. to be here. Now, if you're just listening or if you're watching, uh, we want to note we are recording this above the gym. We've got some athletes playing down there. So if you hear that, you know, this is live podcasting. What are you going to do? Uh, so, Richard, so good to have you on, man. Twenty, Like we said, 2006, 2010, 2021, CIF Girls Soccer Coach of the Year, 2012 California State Coach of the Year. Uh, yeah, that, those are some pretty good accomplishments. Man. Thank you. So, Richard, let's start from the start. Where are you from? Uh, born in Manchester, England. Um, parents brought us over here when I was just a, maybe a two-year-old. Uh, so I grew up in Calabasas, California. Okay. Um, so local to the San Fernando Valley. Uh, grew up, went to all Calabasas public schools, and then uh, moved to the west side where I got into teaching and coaching. And I've been here since 2005. Since 2005. There you go, man. So growing up, Manchester, England, so you got a bit of soccer in your blood. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah, you go. Manchester United fan. Dad is a big Manchester United fan, so we were, uh, we were raised in the game, yeah. There you go. Now, when you were growing up, when did you start playing soccer? Um, I started super young. I think I was three or four years old. Um, the league wouldn't let me play because I was too young, so my mom offered to volunteer as the coach if they would let me play. Yeah. So that was, how I got, that was how I got started. So I was like a year younger than everybody else. Um, but yeah, played, played my whole life and, and fell in love with it at a young age. Cool. So Calabasas High School, is that where you went? Yep. All right, Coyote. and you played there? Yeah, I'm sorry. You played soccer at Calabasas? I did, um, not even all the way through. I, w I was not enamored with the coach and, uh, and some of my experiences there. But it's funny because as unhappy as that relationship was, it formed a lot of the coach that I am now, like my experiences then of, of being in a kind of a negative environment. Yeah. Um, feeds a lot into how I coach now of, of the environment I want to be in and, and want the players to be in. Yeah. Now, what other sports did you play when you were growing up? I played a lot of sports. I played baseball, uh, roller hockey was huge in my area. It was, you know, Gretzky got traded to yeah. the Kings when I was, you know, when I was a teenager and, and 12 and uh, 10. And so I fell in love with hockey. Uh, I played basketball. I'm tall. So everybody always thought I was going to be good. I'm not. Um, but I played that as well. So, yeah, I was always kind of I grew up in, the, in a culture in the Valley at the time of you played a sport in the fall, you played a sport in the winter, you played a sport in the spring, and I even played hockey in the summer, so I, would, I played every, all four seasons I had a different sport. Yeah, there you go, man. Now, after graduating high school, where did you go to college? I didn't. Okay. I didn't. Yeah, I, uh, I flirted with college briefly, yeah. um, and was going to school at night to get a credential. I was just going to Moore Park College, and, and I got a teaching job during the day as a teaching assistant at a private elementary school, and, and that was where I got into coaching, and fell in love with coaching and I was like this is all I want to do this and I just threw myself into it and did it I was doing a lot of coaching coaching at school coaching club soccer and and uh, that was my that was my thing from 19 years old wow man all right so going to school going to Moore Park to get your teaching credential what did you want to teach I thought that I was going to be an English teacher yeah. um you know I really liked I really liked writing I, I loved literature I um really an avid reader and and I loved discussing you know books and and I thought that was going to be my future but I mean, I found out very quickly as I learned more about teaching and, and was working on it that it wasn't it wasn't for me. I was just young, and that was what I thought I wanted to do. Um, but I always knew I wanted to work with kids. Um, you know, that was really probably the driving force behind thinking I wanted to teach. Um, and then I realized once I started coaching that soccer was my subject. You know, like that was, yeah. that was what I wanted to teach. And so uh, it was a really, really easy and quick decision that I've never, ever regretted. I've, I've been teaching for, or coaching for 23 years now, and I love it as much today as I did back then so now now what was your first introduction to coaching like what age level and what was kind of the the thing that drew you in yeah um my first ever team that I had was a sixth grade c volleyball team okay um I never played volleyball I knew nothing about volleyball um the first game was miserable we lost really fast I didn't know what I was doing um and so I went to my athletic director at the time and I said you know hey can I I coach soccer, you know, like yeah. that's, that's a sport I have a little more familiarity with. And so I coached, I think it was a fourth grade girls team. Um, and that was where I found my passion for it and, and really loved it and enjoyed it. I didn't know what I was doing. You yeah. Know, I was clueless. I was just yelling at the ref basically, you know, like, and I thought that's what you did. Um, and then as I learned how you can affect athletes and how you can affect their performance, then, then it becomes really, really, um, 
you know, addicting to, to coach like this, the feedback that you get and the enjoyment of, Hey, I, you know, I, I taught them that, you know, yeah. like that, that feeling is, uh, is still something I'm in, I'm in love with. Yeah. Now at that, at that age, the fourth grade soccer team, what's kind of the focus? Is it really just kind of teaching them the game itself and kind of how it works and like a little bit of the fundamentals? Are you asking what I did then or are you asking what I would do now? <laughs> that I, I guess a little bit, of, I guess a little bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then, um, you know, I thought I was coaching the World Cup final. So, you know, <laughs> you know, then I was very into results and wanting to win because that was sort of the ego boost yeah. that I needed to validate my my coaching. And you were um, 19 at this point? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, you know, a lot of win winning at that age is about getting the ball out of the traffic, which is on the outside. So get the ball to the outsides and then cross it in front of the goal and, and score. Yeah. And, you know, you can win. Put your best athlete at the back. Like, you know, there's it's not that complicated. Um, if I had to do it again... You know, I would have I would have really tried to get them to play together more, <laughs> um, you know, and, and teach them how to play and try to instill more confidence in them versus kind of get it to your best players and, and let yeah. them figure it out. Um, but I've learned a lot in 23 years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I can remember I, I grew up playing similar to you. I played every sport depending on the season and, and ASO soccer was like my first passion I guess you could say and, and at that age I remember my dad was our coach and he was a basketball guy he didn't know anything about soccer so his strategy was just kick the ball as far as you can and somebody go get it yep. and at, at that age that's it works. kind of yeah. it works you know yeah. that's how you win but it's not until I guess later on that you start to learn you know the passing lanes and kind yeah. of the different positions and everything yeah. um, now so after coaching the fourth grade girls team what's kind of the next step when did you let me see you started with the west side breakers in 2001 yeah, so I, I think I had been just kind of, it was just extra income for me coaching. You know, I was, I was a teaching assistant during the day, just coaching after school teams, hourly wage. And about a year and a half into that, the athletic director there was coaching. His name was Jason Kelly. He's Jason Kelly. And he was um, coaching at the West Side Breakers, which was a local club, all girls club on the West Side. I knew nothing about coaching girls or boys. I'd coached both at the school. I had no preference between the two. I liked both, um, but it was an all-girls club, and he needed an assistant coach, so he hired me as his assistant. He had two teams, and I was just helping out, and that was where I really realized, like, man, there's there's just more to coaching. You know, like, I, he was a mentor to me, and, and I learned a lot from him. I did that for about three months, and then um, a team became available. They needed a head coach, and I was offered the head coaching position, and I did that for the Breakers for about 12 years, and, and I loved – I loved that environment because I had a lot of autonomy and I could I could try things and I did a lot of trial and error as a coach during that period of time. But but mostly, you know, I found that that in the girls game, I think it's very similar in the boys. But at the time, like the more I invested, the more players were invested. You know, like so mm -hmm. so they they were really feeding off of whatever energy I was putting into it, um, and that's something that you know I've I've been able to carry over for for a long time. Yeah, absolutely, man. So after after West Side Breakers. So I have you down West Side Breakers from 01 to 2012. Yep. So a pretty solid run yeah. with the West Side Breakers. Yeah. And then I have you moving on to Real SoCal Soccer Club. Yep. And how did that position come? I was coaching two teams at the West Side Breakers at the time that were having a lot of success. We're doing really well. Um, and at the time in the club soccer landscape, uh, something called the ECNL had, had come into existence, which stood for Elite Clubs National League. And it was a club-based league, which was very new to club soccer. Everything was team-based before then. The, the ECNL was, was inviting whole clubs into the league, and you were either in or you were out. There was no way to, to get promoted into it or anything like that. Um, and my two teams, were, as part of Westside Breakers, were not part of the ECNL. Real Socal was. And at the time, Real Socal had, a, had kind of a hole in their, in their club lineup in the two age groups that I was coaching. So they hired me and brought some of my players with them. Um, and that was a major turning point in my coaching career because – because of the autonomy I had at Westside Breakers, I had become very comfortable. You know, mm -hmm. Like I was doing everything the way I wanted to do it. I was trying other people's way. I was doing it my way. And thinking I was having a lot of success, which I was relative to the level that I was coaching at, but not relative to the national, you know, the national level or the top, top teams. And so I went to Real Socal, um, was hired by Alberto Bru, goes by AB, who's, who's still the director there, uh, who's still a very close friend of mine. And he became a mentor for me. That was the best thing I've ever done in my coaching career because I was completely thrown in the deep end, out of my comfort zone, dealing with a very competitive environment. Um, the parents were competitive, the players were competitive, the other coaches were competitive. If you weren't doing well, they were they were thinking about taking your team. Um, but AB stuck by me, you know, and, and really supported me and gave me a lot of opportunity. Um, but also, 
was not shy about telling me where I was doing things wrong. And I have made so many changes in my coaching style and, you know, the way I try to affect a game. Uh, game coaching especially is, is really a lost art in the United States. A lot of coaches are, are yelling at the players, yelling at the rep. You know, they're, they're not really coaching um, and teaching and understanding what to leave alone and, and what to, what's, when it's time to insert yourself. Um, and I learned a lot of that from AB. I was there for about six, six and a half years, and, and it was unbelievably challenging. There were, my first year, I wanted to quit four or five times. I didn't feel supported by my environment. You know, I felt like people wanted me to fail, uh, and I never felt that before. I'd always been in very supportive places. So being, in a, being out of my comfort zone for that long and sticking with it, which is part of my personality, like I, I stay places for a long time because I want to prove myself. Like I always, I didn't play in college. I didn't play professionally. I don't have a great playing resume. So I have to prove myself, and that stuck with me for a long time, that, that desire to prove myself. And that was the place where I did it. So that was, that was an important part of my career. Yeah. Now, when we talk about coaching soccer, and I think, um, you know, I grew up playing soccer, and I can remember at the time, like, I, I, you know, I was born late 80s, grew up in the 90s. So, like, I remember in the 94 World Cup was, like, a huge deal yeah. to me. And then I remember going to school and nobody was watching. Yeah, nobody <laughs> you know yep. what I mean? Yep. Um, I feel like soccer in America has come a long way since then, but st probably still is a relatively lesser known about sports. So when we talk about the coaching style or what you learned about when to input, when not to, what are some of the things in terms of the X's and O's of soccer that, that you learned along the way that, that, you know, made you kind of the coach that you are today? Yeah, I think um – the number one thing that isn't coached enough at the lower levels here that makes the difference, like the jump when you go play a really good team, is the defensive intensity that, that the game requires. Like when you watch it on TV, you watch a professional game, whether it's women or, or men, it doesn't look that fast. Like the players are so composed on the ball, they're so calm, and their spacing is so good that it's really difficult to, to press them. And so it looks like a slow-paced game. Mm -hmm. And so kids... Kids think it's slow sometimes, or parents think it's slow, and they want you to slow down. But when you're actually in it and you're on the field, the pressure on the ball is unbelievable now, and especially at the, at the highest levels. Like it's a pressing game now. You have to be able to press, and you have to know how to press as a group. And I didn't know how to coach team defense. I knew how to coach individual defense. I didn't know how to coach team defense. I think that's the biggest thing now is, is like the game is an up-tempo, high-pressing game, and you have to know how to do it. Um, and then the other thing, you watch the game, and I think that – the nuance that people miss is the ball handling that's happening. Like, it looks like everybody's just passing and receiving, but the actual ball handling under pressure, because the game is a pressing game now. So yeah. if you can't handle pressure, you can't play. Like, you're, you're going to get exposed. So those two dynamics, as, as they, as they you know, sort of push-pull, of when we don't have the ball, we're pressing and we're frantic and we're double-teaming and, and we're getting in people's faces. And then when we do have the ball – you need to be able to handle someone being in your face, yeah. you know, and so so that dynamic is is the style of play that, that we aspire to here, um, and I think that that's what's most difficult to play against. Like you mm -hmm. know, is keeping the tempo high. Is, oops, is how you <laughs> sorry hit the microphone. Is how you make people uncomfortable and, and mm -hmm. become difficult to play against. Yeah, yeah. Now now while you're at Real SoCal is when you started here at Westlake in 2005, correct? Yep. yep. Now. Now, when we talk about Westside Breakers and then Real SoCal, and then later we're going to get to, you know, L.A. Breakers, these are all club teams. Mm -hmm. um, but then you're also coaching at Westlake, which is a high school team. What are some of – because, you know, I, I, I played club when I was a kid. I played for the Claremont Stars for many yep. years. And then, you know, Inland Empire, we had a bunch of teams. It was always like Surf Cup and everything like that. And then there was the high school game where, where club – there was a lot of stress if you wanted to play at the next level of playing club soccer. What are some of the differences between coaching for a club team versus coaching for a school team? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I, would, I would take a step back from that for a second to say that I think me coaching club soccer is a huge advantage to Harvard-Westlake and the players at Harvard-Westlake, mm -hmm. and I think that me coaching high school soccer is a huge advantage to the clubs that I've worked for um, because I'm always thinking about the other one yeah. you know, and, and having empathy for the other one or at least having an understanding of the demands of both. Um, the way I handle it here at Harvard Westlake is I really back off the players in the off season, but I try to design training for them in the off season that will help them with their club seasons. Mm. So that hopefully club coaches and the players and their families understand that what we're doing here is designed to help them be successful with club soccer because the more successful they are there, the better they're going to do here for me at Harvard Westlake. And then the same thing when we're in our Harvard Westlake season, the Harvard Westlake season is short mm. and it's, and it's very, um, 
what's the word? It's very linear. Like we're aiming for that championship at the end. Right. Club soccer is not a, not really built that way. Clubs, there's a lot um, of tournaments kind of all over, and it peaks in it peaks and valleys yeah. at different times, and and it's periodized very differently. The high school season, we play a preseason, we play league, we play playoffs, yeah. and and we're trying to win a championship at the end of the playoffs, and it's just pretty straightforward that way. So. One of the things I try to do with our high school program is, like, we treat it like a sprint. Like, we're, we're just going and we're trying to get to that finish line. Whereas in that off season, I have to understand when they need to peak and when they need to be 100% healthy and able to help their club teams. And if they're hurt or they're tired, they're more likely to be hurt, then it's just a problem for everybody, right? It's a problem for the athlete being injured. It's a problem for their club because they don't have the player available. And it's a problem for me because they're not getting better at soccer. They're not playing. So... You know, everything we do here is injury prevention, strength work, making sure that they can perform for their club teams on the weekends, um, and then hopefully we hit the ground running when our season starts because it is a sprint. Like, if you miss six weeks for an injury, you miss two-thirds of our season. Yeah. So, you know, we, we need them healthy, and, and we want them to be happy, too, when they're healthy and feeling good and, and strong. They're enjoying what they're doing, and that's a huge part of what we do here is try to make this really fun and enjoyable. Like, it's, yeah. it shouldn't be a grind. Like, this is youth sports, so yeah. we want them to enjoy it. Absolutely. Now, and now I, I have to imagine one of the other differences is that obviously with the clubs, you can have players from kind of dotted all over. I mean, you choose the club you want to play for. Whereas with the high school, I mean, you have your girls for four years yep. that are your students. Does that change kind of the way you look at the game or look at the coaching or the team in terms of like, I have these players for four years and this is kind of who my, my talent selection is, as opposed to a club where you're kind of getting players from all over coming to that club. Yes and no. I think um, I'm a huge proponent of high school soccer, which has, in my opinion, come under attack a little bit in the soccer world, mm. you know, with the Development Academy banning high school soccer. U.S. soccer is not a fan of high school soccer, at least or at least presents like it's mm. not a fan of high school soccer. And I'm a huge proponent. But one of the things I love about it is the cycle of four years because right. the team's not the same for four years, but we cycle every year. We graduate seniors, we bring in freshmen. And so there's a new dynamic every year. That new dynamic is leadership opportunities for kids every year. There's a new leadership opportunity. If you play on a club team, which, which you did, right. the dynamic, the leadership dynamic probably stayed pretty static for long periods of time. Like yeah. that guy's our leader, you know, like, or those two players are our leaders. Um, in the high school, like this year, we graduated all our captains. You yeah. know, like they're gone. They're in. They're in college now. So who's going to step into that leadership void? And so we try to build that as we go. Because when I first started here, I was just sort of a victim of circumstance all the time. Mm -hmm. It was always we don't have any leaders this year, or it's going to be a tough season. We don't have any leaders, and I wasn't taking ownership of the process of developing leaders, which is what this school is all about, by the way. And I wasn't embracing it or or really taking it on. And now. You know, we really, really start putting leadership demands on kids as they're finishing their sophomore year and stepping into being upperclassmen. And we baby them a little bit when they're young. We let them be led, you know, like these, these are the leaders and this is how to be led and this is how to show respect so that when they're the older kids, they understand like, oh, I did that, you know, versus how it used to be, which was the seniors dictating to the younger players, you know, carry the bags, move the goals, you know, all, all that, you know, sort of old school, old fashioned stuff. And then it perpetuates, right? Because then you're a senior and you're like, I had to do that, so I'm going to make sure they have to do that. If I had to be miserable, they have to be miserable. Right. Instead, now we flip the dynamic to they took care of me when I was a young player, mm -hmm. and I'm, now I'm going to take care of these kids who are young players. That flip has changed our whole experience here. You know, there, there used to be a lot more friction between the older players and the younger players, and we always rely on freshmen here. All, we have always had a freshman in our starting lineup almost every year that I've been here. And if they feel supported and they can perform, we do better. And if they don't feel supported and like, I can't wait till those kids graduate, right. then we're, we're doomed, you know, like we're, we're destined to fail. So that, that part of it in terms of like the four year team yeah. is how we view that is the, is the constant turnover yeah. and how we prepare for the turnover in club. The leadership dynamic stays so similar, but we can also periodize like I can, if I have a team for three years, I can really work with them a lot. So we can mm. really layer in a lot of tactics and a lot of style of play and try different formations and try different things. The high school season is so short, we right. can't experiment that much. It's right. like, let's find our best lineup. Let's find our best system. Let's maybe have a backup system that in case plan A doesn't work. But we got plan A and plan B, and that's kind of about it. you know. And, yeah. and we're not that deep either, to your point. Like, we can't oh, – our goalkeeper goes down injured. We can't go out and recruit one. Right. Like, it's whatever's on campus. Right. So we, we have to make it work. Yeah. Now, now coming back to a point that you had made um, in terms of the academies and U.S. soccer not being huge proponents of high school soccer, why is that, do you think? 
To be fair, I think that you're looking at a giant landscape of the United States of America. Right. You know, and I'm looking at a very small landscape of Southern California, you know, and, and even specific to Harvard Westlake. They're not talking about one school or one program. So I don't take it personally sure. you know, when they say those things. I know they don't mean any one one team. Um, but I, I, I just think sometimes U.S. soccer has, has these, I say this with all due respect, these sort of delusions of grandeur about mm. their role in player development. Mm. And I'm not sure they actually have that much of a role in player development. Like the people who are developing players are the players at the grassroots level or the coaches at the grassroots yeah. level, uh, club directors, club coaches, AYSO coaches, your dad coaches an AYSO team. Yeah. And if those kids have a good experience, they're probably going to play again next year. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean he was a master tactician, but if he made it a positive experience, they're more likely to keep playing. And that's how we're going to cultivate talent in this country and so that piece of it is the piece I think U.S. soccer is missing about high school soccer is how much fun it is right. and how much kids enjoy it and how much more likely it is to keep them coming back. You know, we, we want kids to come back and look forward to those leadership opportunities. Man, I'm a senior next year. I'm yeah. going to have some, gonna have some additional you know, responsibility, and I want that responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we try to really make it fun. And, and I'm sure there are high schools where it's not fun. Sure. You know, and I'm sure there's high schools where kids get hurt, and, and I hear that one all the time. Kids are more, more likely to get injured in high school. Mm. That has not been my experience. I have seen way more injuries in club soccer than I have, and, and statistically, not anecdotally, statistically, I've seen way more injuries in high school soccer, in club soccer than high school mm. soccer. Um, but again, I'm talking about Southern California, and I'm talking about my club and, sure. my, and my program. Uh, I think it's a great shame, though, because I think these players – Soccer is such, if you're at the national team level, mm. soccer is such an important part of your identity and your school is part of your community. Yeah. And so if you can have that representation of your identity to your community, I think it has an impact on your community. You know, we, I don't know if we're going to talk about Alyssa and Giselle Thompson, but they are, su- they have had such an incredible impact on our community by playing for us. Whereas if they didn't, there would have been so much lost because of that. And so it's just missed opportunity. Like how many times do you get to go to high school? So, right. like, why are, why are you giving things up in life for what? So you can be a little bit better at soccer, but give up all those those life experiences? Right. I'm just not a, I'm not a believer in that. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting, too, because, um, like, having played club soccer, and then I did not go on to play in high school. I ended up playing water polo in high school. But even playing water polo, I think one of the things that was so fun about it is, you know, in club, there was an element of – feeling like a free agent. Like, I'm here to get better. I'm here to learn the game. This is kind of the elite level of competition, so this is where I want to be. Whereas when I was playing water polo in high school, it was also an element of, like, I represent my school, and that was a lot of fun. And it's interesting, too, in that when you look at the U.S. women's national team, that has to be a huge motivator for all those women, too, is not just playing at the most elite level, but, like, representing your country. And there's, I think, a direct correlation between representing your high school to then maybe wanting to go on to represent your country. So I do yeah. think that that is something that might get lost in translation there. 100%. And I think I, I make that comparison all the time. Like if you look at pro soccer, like the, the club that they play for is their employer. Right. right? That's, that's who they work for. Their country is who they represent, mm-hmm. which means it represents them, it represents right. part of their identity, which is, which is the same thing here. So it's that ownership piece, right? Like I, I feel ownership when I play for Harvard Westlake because that's my school. Right. Whereas when I play for my club... Well, that's my team, mm-hmm. but I hear kids say all the time, that's the team I play on. Right. They don't say that's my team. Right. And so you're right. It can be more nomadic. Like you're, you can be, if it's not a great fit, which we hear all the time, it's just not a good fit. Right. So let's go find another team, you know, whereas if it's your high school in soccer, we don't see the transfers that other sports see. This is your school. So make it work. Yeah. And these are your classmates, you know, and so there, and there's a, such a different dynamic between playing with your classmates than playing with your club mates. But you might see a practice and then you don't have to talk to them again. Yeah classmates you're eating lunch with them you're seeing them in class like it's just a different dynamic to me it's a really healthy dynamic you know that's where their that's where their long-term relationships are built absolutely now now you got to Westlake in 05 what was it that brought you to Westlake from having been at the club level to then you know working with the high school um I was coaching high school I was coaching high school at Crossroads in Santa Mm -hmm. Monica um not having a very good experience, to okay. be honest. Uh, the school didn't take sports very seriously. I did not have very committed kids. Um, to be honest, it was just extra income for me. I was a young coach, and I was coaching club soccer and picking up extra income as a high school coach. And uh, was Jason Kelly, actually, the guy that gave me my first opportunity in club coaching. He had spoken to the athletic director here who had asked him for recommendations for a soccer coach. Um, mm. And so he recommended me. 
and I didn't really know a lot about Harvard Westlake other than it was this prestigious, amazing place. I knew it was the number one school in Los Angeles because I grew up in LA, and, right. and so I knew that, but I'd never been here before, uh, you know. And I, I remember coming here for the first time, and it was in the summer. There was no school, and I arrived on the campus, and I saw the stadium and the field, and I looked at the buildings, and I was like, "Oh my goodness! Like this is, you know, this is another level of mm-hmm. like it looks like a college, you know." And yeah. and I met with Odrius Barzdukas, who was the uh, who was the athletic director, and I had pictured like this old Greek guy in my head, you know, and, and he was a younger he was a younger guy, and he was great, and and everything he was talking about was exactly exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, Terry Barnum, who's now our head of athletics, was in that interview with me, and we talk about it all the time. We were just speaking the same language, like how to build a program, and, and we have a middle school and a high school here, mm-hmm. and how to how to vertically integrate those things. So the seventh graders are experiencing the same thing as the, as the seniors. And I just, I left here. I was so excited. You know, I really wanted the opportunity to, to come in and build my, something in my, you know, my own image. And, and I knew the school wanted it. Um, and so I was very fortunate that it worked out because I was 25 years old and yeah. wildly underqualified <laughs> to, to be the head of program here. I look back, it's, they took a chance on me. You know, they, they really did. They, they saw something and gave me an opportunity. Don't have a college degree. Uh, had not been coaching at the highest level, had not had success at Crossroads. It's not like I was coach of the year there or doing anything special, um, but really just had a good interview and, and hit it off and, and had, you know, found some, some kindred spirits, and that was it. Off we went. Yeah, and, and obviously, I mean, you've had some success. You've been here for, what, 16 years now, and, you know, like we said at the top of the show, you know, three-time CIF Girls Coach of the Year, one-time California State Coach of the Year. So obviously – some success. Now, you, you mentioned it there before, not only the varsity girls soccer coach, but the head of the girls soccer program here. Um, and now at, at the club level as well, where you're working with the, uh, the LA Breakers, uh, also the, the director of club development there as well. What are some of the differences in coaching versus being the head of the program or being the director of the club development in terms of the extra responsibilities or maybe seeing more of the big picture in terms of the development of these kids? Yeah. It's going to be a really long answer. I'll try it. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a, a long-form podcast. Yeah, that's long, what it's for, There's right? a long, uh, there's a lot there, right? Like the, the club now um, is a major passion project for me. Uh, I was at Westside Breakers, as, as we mentioned, for 12 years. And the reason I left is the club didn't have ECNL. That mm-hmm. was the impetus behind me going to Real Socal. And in 2017 or 18, when the DA was formed, the Development Academy was formed, Real Socal entered the league. And that was why I left Real Socal because mm-hmm. I was working here and the Development Academy didn't allow kids to play high school soccer. Yeah. It's a conflict of interest for me. So I said, I'm not going to put myself in that situation. Um, and so I've got to go. And I left very amicably. AB and I are still friends. But I went back to the West Side Breakers who are run by a gentleman named Mike Page. And I said to Mike, you know, I think there's a real opportunity for the Breakers here to get ECNL. Real Socal is leaving the league. They're going to the Development Academy. The ECNL is going to need a club in Los Angeles. And I've built relationships in my six years in the ECNL, and, and I would love to leverage some of those relationships and, and see what we can do. And so, you know, we started to work on that, and we realized an all-girls club with 22 teams was, was a little small for the ECNL. We needed mm. to grow. Um, and so we pursued a merger with a club called FC Los Angeles, uh, which was an all-boys club. I mean, they were almost exactly the same size, I think 23 teams. Uh, and we eventually merged and became LA Breakers, and we immediately got an ECNL yeah. maybe two weeks later, which, which was a major accomplishment for our club that had been around for almost 20 years and, and had never been on the map and, and had that type of opportunity. Um, and so that, that work is really challenging because we are competing on a national level. We have boys and girls. We start at 8 years old and go to 18 years old. But we also have players that play on second and third teams in the club who don't aspire to play in college that we want to provide a great experience mm-hmm. to. So there, there's, it has to be so dynamic, the role there of, of how do we provide service to 670 players with all kinds of aspirations and agendas and, and desires and abilities. We have a staff of 30 coaches, and so you know, you know, keeping all of them motivated and, and on task. So that job is very labor-intensive in terms of management, you know, managing all those things and trying to create programming, we just launched a brand new sports performance program. We're launching a, a mental health and, and mental coaching skills clinics. Um, Ten of those that every player will have access to. Uh, then we got to get field space. Then we got to mm-hmm. you know you know then we've got to figure out you know how to schedule our leagues and order referees and trainers and the nuts and bolts of, of running an organization. Whereas here, um, 
I'm so well supported resource wise with athletic directors and, and um, administrative assistants who, who handle a lot of the nuts and bolts for me where I can focus on hiring a staff, working with that staff, uh, creating a culture and a curriculum for our program where you know our seventh graders have a very different experience than our high schoolers, but hopefully just as positive of an experience. We, we really believe in inclusivity in our program. Every kid is welcome where we are. Um, hoping to strike a balance between being a no-cut program where every kid that wants to play soccer has a place to play soccer and we'll have a great coach and we'll have a great teammates and we'll have a great experience. They all get the same uniform quality. They all get the same practice gear quality, uh, same field space opportunities uh, so that they all have a great time. But we're also CIF Division One champions. Right. So we can, we can still have a competitive program and do that for every single kid. And that's something I'm really passionate about where I look at some of these other programs and it's like, you might be winning a championship, but you cut 23 kids who don't get to go to another high school. Mm. So they just didn't get to play high school soccer. Right. And I understand that. You know, th there's resource you know, limitations, and, and sometimes you just got too many kids, and you got to figure it out. So that's not a criticism. But here we have the resources. So why am I not trying to make it work for everybody? Um, and so that's, that's been a major shift. When I first started here, I didn't think you could do both. Mm. So I focused on winning. Uh, you know, at the middle school, we had A team and B team. And, and what I found was the B team kids were quitting yeah, because there was no future for them. And they were trying to find another sport. They were playing field hockey or cross country or track where, hey, they're not going to cut me. You know, like I can, right. I can represent my school and wear the HW and, mm -hmm. and take pride in what I'm doing. I want them to be proud to be part of this program. And, and I want them to feel part of the program. I don't want them to feel like they're spectators of, man, the varsity team's so good. And I'm part of that program. I want them to say, I played on the middle school team this year, and we had a really good time. Right. So doing both of those things here is, is what I'm passionate about and where I try to put a lot of my energy, you know, is, is making sure everybody has a good, has a good positive time. Yeah. Now, now, you mentioned it both at the club level and at this level, at the club level with second and third teams and with A and B teams at the school level. And, you know, not everyone is going to be an elite level player. Not everybody, most nobody is going to go to the college or the professional level at this. So what is it that... At the school level or at the club level, you're trying to instill in the players outside of the game itself that, that they can take with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first thing is going to sound a little a little cliche or like I'm pandering here, but I, but we have a we brought in a new president of our school. Mm. I think he came in around 2014 or 15, but don't quote me on that. But he uh, he rewrote the mission statement of the school, and in his first in the first year of the mission statement, it was kind of all we talked about. Um, you know, to the point where people didn't want to hear about it anymore. Um, and I was one of those people. Mm -hmm. But it took time, and it eventually really sunk in on me of, of we were trying to change the direction of the school. Mm -hmm. The school had become kind of a meat grinder and, and hyper-competitive and all about what college you got to or all about what your SAT score was. And we'd lost sight of the experience and the journey. And now, you know, so the mission statement is about a joyful pursuit of excellence mm -hmm. and a purpose beyond yourself. And, and we were in and inclusivity and being an inclusive community – and we have really embraced that in our program. Yeah. Um, and that, that is the piece where, you know, we want kids to, to really have joy, you know, so we have fun at practice. You know, we have, we have joy with, we play music when we're in the weight room, you know, like we, we try to find ways to, to have joy in what we're doing. Um, and it's hard too, it's hard work. You know, the middle school kids have to try hard, you know, they have to do their best. But what starts to happen is they take so much pride in it that when we play games, we don't want to lose. Right. Because we're really proud of, of what we're doing. Um, and then I think that purpose beyond ourselves is, is getting them to understand, you know, that there's a tradition here and there's there's a legacy that you're going to leave behind. And so what's your impact going to be? You know, what will people remember your team for, you know, and, and your time here for? Will it be forgotten about or will it be remembered? And what will it be remembered for? And so those are the, those are the types of conversations that we're having. And, and those are the things that seem to be more impactful on, on a lot of our kids. Because sure. we have some special players who could easily either blow off high school soccer or could go through the motions in it, and they want to leave a legacy. You know, they, yeah. they, it matters to be successful at this place because if you're successful here, you could probably be successful anywhere. And sure. so, you know, that's uh, it's something to take pride in. Now, now, you mentioned them earlier, and then kind of a little bit again, you've got two sisters on your team this year, the Thompson sisters, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Uh, just... By all accounts, and I've only read a little bit about them, but yeah. a couple of world beaters, really, right? I mean, just elite of the elite. What is it like coaching talent like that? It's really easy. <laughs> um, no, they, uh, they are so special. But I always say, like, they're, they're so special in so many ways. Uh, Alyssa is the older one. Alyssa mm -hmm. Thompson is the junior. Um, and Giselle Thompson is the sophomore. And they are 
very different, um, but also the same. You know, like they, they influence the game very differently. Um, Alyssa is a pure goal scorer. Yeah. Like just an unstoppable force who is going to score. Like she's so determined to score. She's so relentless in her pursuit of scoring. And she can score in so many different ways. You know, she can score from long range shots. She can dribble by you. Uh, she can do a lot, a lot of things. Giselle is more of a playmaker, um, a great dribbler, a great passer, has an unbelievable vision. But they're the same in their determination, in their mental toughness, in their physical fitness, their work ethic. You know, their, their daily ability to show up and be present is just on that elite pro level, you know, that, that we read yeah. about with top, top athletes of just how mentally present they are mm-hmm. and what they're doing. Um, and they are so determined to get better that they never waste a day. Yeah. You know, like every day is an opportunity to get better and, and – you know, Alyssa's had a little bit of a bad ankle recently, and a lot of kids would beg out of sports performance or beg out of training when they're not 100%. She's asking for a modified workout, you know, right. like, what, what can I do mm-hmm. versus, oh, I can't do that. Mm. What can I do? Um, and the effect that it's had here has transcended our program. Like, it's transcended our school. I, I get emails from sixth graders who are going to apply to seventh grade because of the Thompsons you right. know, and, and because of how fun it was to come and watch them play. And, you know, we had huge crowds in the playoffs of little girls. Right. We've never had before because we're private school. So right. people don't usually go. They go to their local public school. Mm. They don't usually go to a private school when you're in fifth grade right. to watch high school kids play. We had, we had tons of little girls, you know, cheering on our team, which was such a rewarding and fun experience. It was so different. You know, it was a very different body. You know, it's little kids. Yeah. It's not like, you know, it's, it's not like it was wild and rowdy. You know, they're little kids. But – we would score and the kids would go sprinting down the track to celebrate. Yeah. You know, and it was just fun. You know, yeah. like it was especially coming off of COVID when nobody could attend anything. Yeah. Um, you know, we had we had these boisterous crowds that were wholesome. You know, it was a really yeah. wholesome experience, uh, which I never thought I would say. Um, but it was so cool. And it's still what's amazing is that's gonna have an impact for years, mm. you know, years of that impact. And because they were the a big part of the impetus, the team was amazing too, and they you know, the whole team won that championship. But those girls were so, you know, like I said, they transcended everything so much that some of these kids that are coming to the school because they want to follow in Alyssa and Giselle's footsteps, that will inspire them all the way through. You know, yeah. where we can say these are the things Alyssa and Giselle did. These are the things that the team did, and they want to they want to do it too. So, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to not get hyperbolic when you're yeah. when you're talking about them because they they are yeah. so impactful on, on what they're doing and they're so fun to watch. They're so exciting. Like they're not. I've coached great players who were sort of ham and egging it, like they, they just did their thing, and you're like, you appreciated it. Yeah. Uh, but these two, they just, you know, they're, they're worth the price of admission. They're so exciting, yeah. you know, so it's, it's fun. Yeah. Now, speaking of worth the price of admission, when we talk about professional level women's sports, in, in my opinion, it seems like soccer is going to be kind of, I don't even know if I want to say the next, but maybe even the first kind of professional level women's sports to really break out. We just saw, you know, the U.S. women's national team just one equal pay with the men's national team. Um, we've got the, 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 the NWSL. And, uh, and, and, you know, like, personally, I'm a big LAFC fan. I'm really excited Angel yeah. City is coming. Yeah. What do you see as the future of women's soccer at the professional level? Is it, what do you think it's going to take for it to kick off and start to become as widely viewed as some of the men's games? Oh, man. <laughs> That's such a hard question. Um, First of all, I hope that it does. Yeah. Um, you know, I really hope that it does because it, it, I've seen it when our women's national team is in the World Cup and, mm. and is or the Olympics and is, is doing its thing. I've seen the impact of the ripple effect that it has through youth soccer and, and how many more girls are, are inspired to play. Um, I've seen the kids who are already playing, the inspiration it has on them of, of finding another gear and, and being so motivated by it. Um, I am really excited about Angel City. Yeah. Um, I think them playing at Bank of California is going to be great. Yeah. That's a beautiful stadium. I think we need it here in Los Angeles because there's so many girls playing soccer here in Southern California. For us not to have a pro team in L.A. Um, was a real miss for the league. Um, yeah. So I'm really excited about it. I think that in order for it to get there, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. What I will say is I think Angel City's approach of being very, very um, – know female led Mm. I think is a really smart move um, and is the right move because all of the people that are in leadership positions whether they're the players um, you know the coaching staff the management team the front office the business end uh, I think that we want role models and and I think that that hopefully is what the community will actually get behind is I'm going to take my daughter to watch something that not only does she aspire to do but I aspire for her to do Um, 
And I think that's a little bit different. Like the, the model of pro sports, like when I watch pro sports, even when I was a kid, I didn't watch it thinking I want to play for the Dodgers. Right. I just enjoyed watching the Dodgers as a sports fan. I wasn't, right. I wasn't aspiring, you know, pro athlete. Um, this is different. You know, this is different because these, the, the women that are on our national team, you know, they have a voice now and they've used their platform and to, to speak to their beliefs. And, and that's something we want for our kids, whatever their beliefs are, we want them to be, to be self advocates and, and to fight for what they believe in. So I hope that it can become something that's really big and, and really positive, you know, and yeah. isn't, and isn't just about, you know, can they, can they earn the same money or, you know, can it, can it be as popular? Um, I'm not sure that is the most important thing. Like sure. it, if it can be a force of change and a force of good, uh, in this world and it can inspire, I work with, I work with youth athletes. If it can as- inspire them to play or play harder, I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So, so I hope for that. Yeah, absolutely. The same. And, and I think, you know, I mean, I remember when they announced Angel City and then I saw who the owners were and then I yeah. saw who kind of the coaches they were bringing in. I was like, wow, this is going to be really cool. Yeah. I, my little sister works for the LA Dodgers Foundation. Nice. She's, you know, really following closely of, is there yeah. going to be, you know, it, it's somebody like her, even my sister, who's a yep. woman in sports, which is, you know, it, she's in the minority there and now seeing this kind of all women led professional sports team. And, like, she's even thinking, like, is, is there room for me there? You know, yep, and so I exactly. love it. And then seeing, you know, seeing as a, as a big fan of LAFC how the city got behind LAFC and Galaxy, if you're counting <laughs> Galaxy, yeah. uh, and then Angel City playing in Bank of California. I, I, I agree with you. I think it is something that people are really going to get behind, and I think it's exciting. Yeah. Um, now, as we wrap up, this is something that I like to ask everybody on the show just as kind of a final question. For you, what has sports done in your life, and what does sports mean to you? <sighs> sports has been a huge part of my life. Obviously, it's what I do for a living. Um, sports has changed and evolved for me. I've, uh, when I look back, I've, I've had a lot of phases of love and hate with, <laughs> with sports. Sure. Um, high school was a time where I didn't like sports mm-hmm. um, and moved away from it uh, because of negative experiences that I had. As a kid, I was obsessed uh, watching sports, playing sports, You know, just playing in the backyard. Like I just loved sports. And then when I got into coaching and was coaching heavily, I was, I was a hockey fan, but I wasn't that into watching pro sports. I felt like I had enough sports in my life. And mm-hmm. now I'm a huge Dodger fan. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm really into it now. And I've realized the pro sports is a release for me now. Sure. Like watching the Dodgers is an escape. You yeah. know, from, it's not my team, right? Like right. it's my team I support, but, it's, but I don't have vested interest if we lose. Uh, coaching sports ha- is still such an emotional roller coaster for me. Mm-hmm that there are still times I can be very low, you know, from a, from a bad loss or not so much the winning and losing, but a performance that makes you question what you've been doing, you know, mm. like, man, that really didn't work. And yeah. I just spent three months on it and yeah. it didn't work. Um, it's also for me, something that I take home with me, which is something I'm trying really hard to work on, but sure. it's very hard to not be thinking about tomorrow's game when you're trying to sleep or, you know, what your practice plan is or, or those types of things or, going on with this team and I, I got to help this other team in my my director role um you know unhappy parents or, or whatever so sports to me I try to put all of that uh, all of that sort of noise you know of all, yeah. the, all those things that are that are noise and remember that sport is where our kids learn to be tough mm. this is where they learn teamwork it's where they learn leadership it's where they learn communication it's where they learn that we're going to lose sometimes mm. and you still got to keep showing up. Like I still go to work the next day after that loss, you know, like I, I always, whenever we get knocked out of the playoffs here, I'm always at work the next day. Right. Like a lot of people take some time off, which yeah. I also understand is probably healthy, but I want to show the kids like we keep showing up and right. we, we go again, you know, like uh, we got to keep, we got to just keep going. And that I get made fun of a lot here by my <laughs> players because I use the word adversity a lot. Mm. Um, and I hashtag it sometimes, which, which <laughs> I think is funny, but they never laugh. Um, but like that's the that's where the meat of sport mm-hmm. is really for me. Like like we only ever see the winners, you know. Like yeah. but but there's so much losing that happens, and you have to just keep showing up and keep going. And that was a big thing mantra for me during COVID was like let's just keep showing up. Yeah. We were zooming so much, and it was sucked, you know. Like it wasn't fun after a while, but we got to keep showing up. Yeah. Like just keep being there and keep turning your camera on and just keep trying, and it slowly will get better. And then six months later, whatever it was in the end. We won a championship, yeah. You know, and and the people that won the championship were the ones that kept showing up mm-hmm. because not everybody was still on the team by that point. We sure. did have people quit during COVID, and I don't blame them. I'm sure they had their reasons, but the people that kept showing up, they got the reward in the end. 
Um, and I was so proud of that team and everybody that was there because they had such an amazing attitude through so much adversity. Um, and that's what sports are for me. Like sports are like, you know, I love when we go on the road and it's a hostile crowd in the playoffs, yeah. like, cause I'm a soccer coach and, and youth soccer coach, like right. club games, there's never been any, there's no one there. You right. know, it could be the national championship. There's nobody there to watch. Right. In high school soccer, you go on the road and there's three, 400 people and they're heckling you and that's when we find out what we're made of, you know, like that's, that's where I'll know if all the work we did was, was worth it. And if it worked, like, are the leaders stepping up or are, are, are people dealing with it? Uh, so that's, that's what sports are for me. That's amazing. Well, coach Richard Sims, Harvard Westlake, thank you so much for coming on the show. Congratulations on all your success and good luck with the upcoming season. Was there anything else you wanted to add? No, thank you very much for having me. This was, this was great. I'll look, uh, I'll look forward to supporting you guys. Thank you so much, man. We appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Thank you for listening on Spotify, Apple Pods, or wherever else you get your podcasts. If you guys want to check us out, we are on Instagram at Canon Sports. We are on TikTok at Canon Sports Official. And of course, CanonSports.com for all of your sporting good needs. Thank you guys so much, and we will see you next time.